I'm Manish from uh, DGraph Labs, and I'm talking about binary encoding, flat buffers, and gRPC. Just a bit of pretext pre before, uh, not not more than this. Just a bit of pretext before we begin. Um, at DGraph, we aim to build a low latency, um, uh, high throughput distributed graph database. Data is distributed among different servers, different nodes in the cluster. To execute a query, as you can imagine, in a distributed system, you need to have multiple nodes communicating with each other. Communication requires encoding and serialization of information and then decoding back into whatever format, the language format that you have to be able to interpret it. Um, and you want to keep the latency and the memory usage involved in this communication low. So what are some of the current protocols for communication? We have Golang's native uh, net RPC package, which by default uses GOB encoding. And then we have uh, Google's uh, gRPC.io, which uses protocol buffers by default, which is also the like, most popular choice um, because it supports a lot of languages. And then we have GoGo Protobuf, which is a faster version of protocol buffers specifically for Go language, uh, which also works with gRPC.io by default. But there is something called flat buffers, which might, a lot of you might not know. How, how many people do know about flat buffers if they can raise their hands? All right, only four people out of 30 people, maybe. Um, flat buffers is a very efficient choice. It's created by, created by uh, developers at, at Google for game development and other performance critical applications. What sets flat buffer apart from other uh, uh, protocol choices is that it represents hierarchical data in a very flat binary buffer in such a way that it can still be accessed directly without parsing. So essentially, when it generates um, this, uh, the, the, the slice of bytes, um, it stores their indexing information up front so it knows exactly where to access without necessarily converting into a Go um, structs or other language structs. The buffer doesn't need to recreate the entire information in language specific data structures. It makes it faster than protocol buffers. And the only memory needed to access uh, your data is that of the byte slice, which comes from the network, nothing more. This is how a typical flat buffer might look like. You have a table query. Uh, they call it table. It's essentially a struct. Uh, we have some strings, attribute string, count, int, offset, integer, after uid, which is like uh, uint64. Then we have get count, which is u short, which is, I think, int32, um, uint32. And then we have uids, which is a list of uint64s, and turns, which is a list of strings. To parse this thing, all you have to do is you have to call get root as query, which takes in the buffer, the, the byte array that you got from the network, and just call or with offset zero, you just say flat buffer get u offset. Um, it calls query.init, and if you look at query.init below it, you see it just sets the bytes to that buff and set the position equals to y, and that is all. That's the entire parsing that was done. So you can see it's almost like zero cost. Now, <clears throat> So DGraph responses can contain, uh, DGraph is, uh, is, the, is the cloud database that we're working on. It contains millions of entities and binary blob values per request. It could contain that many. And we don't want to allocate that many Go data structures because you know Go being a garbage selected uh, language, it's going to cost us quite some um, uh, performance. So we use flat buffers for all internal data representation and storage, which means we also want to use flat buffers for communication. Um, now, NetRPC, as, as I mentioned before, it uses encoding, GOB encoding by default. Um, so how do we make NetRPC work with flat buffers? Um, there is, as it turns out, is a way to specify custom encoding for NetRPC. And we're going to look into that. So first of all, let's uh, define our query and response. They are very simple. Um, they are Go structs. They have byte slices for data, and both of them. So we have query and we have reply. And uh, we need to have a header. Now, header is before a request or response gets passed, we need to, um, NetRPC needs to be able to figure out the sequence ID, uh, the method that it needs to call, and the data for that method, right? So we need a way by which we can send it over the wire and let the other person know. Um, so what we do is we do something pretty simple. We use the binary package um, inside, um, yep. We can use the binary package in Go. And we use little um, Indian, and we use um, sequence number. So sequence number, method, and data is actually passed to the right header. And so it, um, it uh, converts it into a byte array for sequence. It puts the length of the method there. It puts the length of data there. Then it puts the actual method name, um, sets any errors, and then writes it out 
to the wire. The RWC is actually the wire, right? So this is how we write header. How do we parse header? We do the exact opposite of what we just did. We first read the sequence number, then we read the, the method size, then we read the data size, then we um, allocate that many bytes as we need for the method size. We parse the method uh, rwc.read. This is our uh, method name. And we return nil if there is no error, right? So, so these two are pretty clear, right? So we have, um, just to go back, we have write header and then we have parse header, right? They're both doing exactly opposite of what each other does. One is, one is writing to the wire, one is reading from the wire. Right? So now server codec. Um, server codec um, is a very simple one. So it, it, it takes the IO read write closer, which is essentially um, the network. And then it takes a payload length. And we're going to see how we use payload length. Um, so we have actually two methods over here. One is to read the request header, and one is to read the request body. So in the request header, we need to be able to populate in the rpc.request um, the sequence number, the service method, and we also populate the payload length. This is mostly for our own purposes. And then we have read request body, where we, um, we are given um, uh, interface, which is essentially query in our case. And then we look at the payload length that was populated by the read request header. And we, we just populate that much. And we set that uh, data to B. B is that uh, byte array that we just created, right? By, by the promise that we have from, uh, from NetRPC, both of these functions get called in pairs. And they, are not, uh, they don't have to be thread safe. Essentially, you have one connection. And one connection uses one server codec. And so they are both going to be called one after the another. We don't have to worry about payload length being, uh, there's no base condition between um, two server codecs, essentially. Right. And we have one special request over here, which is sometimes Go might decide that it might require you to read the request, but then discard it. And so what it will do is like, it will send you a data interface, which is essentially nil. And then you, you, you still read the data, but then you just discard that request. All right. So this is how the server codec looks like. Um, and then similar thing goes for the write response. Write response, on, on the other hand, actually has to be um, thread safe uh, because they could be writing it through multiple um, go routines. So if you look at it, it's, it's, it's still pretty trivial. Um, you write the header. Uh, you have the RWC, which is the wire. You have the sequence number, which comes from the response automatically. Go populates this. You have the service method, and you have the reply data. Right, and then once you have created the header and written the header out to that wire, then you write the data to the wire. Yeah. That was how the server code works. Client code actually works in a very similar way. Essentially, you have the reverse of whatever function they had. Um, so in the server one, just to go back, we actually were doing read request header and read request body, and in the client we have uh, read response header and read response body. Essentially, they are both called in pairs. Right, and then we have write request in the client as well, which is I think I, I would assume this is the um, thread safe uh, method. All right, so we have essentially defined um, a server codec, and then we have over here a client codec which does pretty similar stuff. Um, uses the same functions. In fact, actually uses the parse header over here, and then this is like while reading the response, and then we have the um, write header when we are writing the request from the client. So, so now we have a way by which we can, we have a custom codec for, for NetRPC. Um, we need one more thing, which is we want to parallelize the requests that go from the client to the server. We want to actually have, we want to make, each client should be able to make multiple requests to the server at the same time, because server is going to use go routines for each request, uh, but we don't want the client to be stuck just waiting for one connection. So what you do is you create a connection pool, and connection pool is something pretty uh, simple if you, once you, get your, once you wrap your head around it, you actually have a, a bunch of, um, uh, you actually create a channel of RPC clients, uh, which you get an RPC client if you dial a new connection, and we'll see how we create a new pool. So we create a new pool, we set the address, we create this channel, we set the channel capacity to max cap. So max cap is something you can define. You can be like, we need five uh, live connections all the time, or we need 10 or 100, depending upon uh, what kind of um, um, overhead you want to have. And um, 
So then you create p.dialnew. We'll see the next slide how the dial.new works. Um, you get a client from dialnew, and then you just store that in this channel, right? The reason to use channel is because they're supposed to be thread safe. So we just use the channel to be able to like pick a connection from it. And then once we're done with it, we just push it back to the channel, right? And if you're not able to pull anything, then we'll dial a new connection. And we'll see that happening. So connection pool. This actually is a very trivial code. It looks long, but all it's happening is you start with a net dot dialer, you have a timeout. It's always a good idea to have a timeout. Um, we do a um, um, dial for that particular address that you have over TCP. Um, and you check for certain error. So if in case we actually get an error where the error is refused, you don't want to retry. There's no way you're going to be able to connect. So you just break away straight away from it. Um, otherwise, you retry. And you, we actually have a sleep condition over here because um, even though you might think the timeout would only time out after three minutes, in certain cases, it timeouts immediately. So you want to still retry after, after every 10 seconds. So this particular loop does 60 retries, which essentially gives us 10 minutes of trying to connect to the other server. Right, And once we have a connection established, we um, pass it on to a client codec. This is actually the client side. So we pass it on the client codec. And we return uh, rpc.new client with codec. So actually contains two functions like that. One is the new server with codec, and the other one is new client with codec. So we use, we use these. Right. So now we, have a, now we know a way by which we can create a new connection um, to talk to the other. Um, server. Now let's see how do we uh, request it from the pool, right? So our get is very simple. We do a select. We see if we are able to pull from Peter clients, which if you recall, it's a channel, right? If you're able to pull from it, then you return that client back. If you're not able to do that, then you dial a new connection um, and you return that. And then we have a call method. Um, so call, essentially, um, in this case, we simplified it a bit. Instead of like doing a get and then put, we just like directly exposed a call method, in which case you can pass in a service method, and you pass in the arguments, and it automatically will retrieve a connection. And it's going to like attempt to do a call on that connection, and then put that client back into the channel once it's done. Right. And again, like we again recheck it because we actually have a max capacity. Let's say you set it to five. So if you if you had dialed a new connection and you're trying to put it back, but the channel is full, then you just close that client and let it destroy itself. Right. So there's a bit, bunch of tricks. Essentially, it's a way to create a connection pool. You, you would have seen connection pools in a bunch of other languages. Almost all languages have some sort of concept of connection pools. This is just a easy way to create a connection pool. And as you can see, it's not clean because this particular approach it doesn't do a clean exit uh, because of the way we do gets and stuff. So if you need to do that, then you need to have mutexes and stuff on top of this, which makes it a bit more complicated. Uh, but we, uh, the way we're using it, we create a pool at the starting, and then it stays uh, alive for the entire program run. So we don't need to worry about closing it down. So. Um, what did we do here? Um, this basically allowed us to use flat buffers uh, to RPC communication using Go standard NetRPC. And does it work? Yes, we used it for both 0 0.2 and 0 0.3 releases in DGraph. Um, essentially, what it is, even if, you, even if you're not sure right now, like how does flat buffer relate to this thing, essentially, flat buffer gives you a byte slice. And we just saw a way by which we can transmit a byte slice over the network using custom encoding. Because if you think about it, if you were to create a Go struct with a byte slice and use encoding.gob over it, that would actually go to, um, there's, there's going to cost you um, certain memory overhead and it's going to cost you certain CPU overhead. Because essentially what that encoding will do is, is going to like copy over the entire byte slice again into a new byte slice to, before it sends it over the network. And you don't want that. So essentially what we did was we avoided that by directly writing that by slice to the network. So, um, so now we had a way by which we could use uh, NetRPC, but then we started seeing certain issues that we wanted to do. We needed a way to track and surface slow RPCs. And this actually goes back to what David was talking about with tracing. Uh, that's something that was not available readily from NetRPC. 
Google actually had an amazing way uh, internally to achieve this using Stubby, which is Google's, Google's proprietary RPC system. And when I surfaced this question on, uh, on the GoBridge uh, forum, Dave Cheney suggested checking out grpc.io, which uh, we had initially rejected uh, in the past because of its reliance on protocol buffers, and we didn't want to use protocol buffers. Um, but Samir Ajmani's talk um, pointed that grpc is a ground up rewrite of Google's internal Stubby, which made me think and look deeper. So, uh, on a, a, a tangential basis, Jeff Dean, who is also from Google, he gave a pretty amazing talk about achieving consistently low latency in distributed systems. And I'm just going to give you give you the the summary of this of this whole talk of, of his like years of research, uh, is that um, what you can do is if you have multiple servers with the same data replicas essentially, and you want to achieve low latency, you want to query the same data, all of them have the same copy. Uh, what you do is you send the request to the first replica, telling it that you're going to send the same request to another replica two milliseconds later. Right? Two milliseconds later, you send the request to the second one, telling it that you have sent the request to the first one. So they both have each other's IP addresses. Right? When one of them starts processing the request, it sends a cancellation request to the second one. Right? And if the second one has not started processing that request, it would just cancel it. Right? So essentially what you do is like you, in case one of them actually is, is, is very busy serving a lot of requests and is not able to reply back within two milliseconds, then the second one is going to start serving it. But you don't broadcast to all of them because that would increase the network traffic in the entire cluster. So you do this thing where you, you wait for two milliseconds before you send it to the other one. Right? So it, only in rare cases, would both of the processes do the work twice, only in rare cases. And overall, your latency is going to improve because you, you only wait for so long. Um, I think there was a question in the same talk where somebody says, hey, why don't you send, it, send both of them the same request together? And the problem with that approach is if both of them are sitting idle, they got to immediately process the request, in which case they do the work twice. So you avoid that by having that small two millisecond delay. Uh, so this is, you should probably like check out his talk. It's a very interesting one. Um, but his talk, and, and the thing is, we are building a low latency system, and we actually have replicas. So his talk got us thinking, how do we implement that in our system? And that's when we, we, we discovered context. We had, we had heard about them, but we didn't realize how grpc.io is essentially built around those kind of like research that Google had done. So to achieve what Jeff Dean would propose would require quite a bit of code without context and also more code to tr track the slow RPCs and stuff, contests give you all of this for free, right? Canceling a pending request from a client to a server over the network is essentially as simple as calling a cancel function, which if you say context dot, um, I think with cancel or context dot with deadline or timeout, it essentially gives you a function back that you can call to cancel a request. So that makes it really, very simple, right? And then essentially you get tracing uh, with context that you can attach to a context. And so you get the debug requests and debug events as David just showed you guys. So switching to grpc.io would actually have all of these benefits for us, but we didn't want to give a flat buffers uh, because they are really fast. That's when we found that grpc.io also supports custom encoding, which a lot of people I, I realize don't, including me, didn't know. So let's look at uh, protocol buffer definition. We have a very simple one. Uh, we have message payload, which has bytes data. This is exactly the same as what you saw before with the query and the reply where we had uh, byte slices uh, for data. In this case, we just express the same thing in protocol buffer definition. And then we have a service, which is a gRPC service. It has four methods, four RPCs, hello, get a sign, mutate, server tasks. And if you look carefully, they take in a payload and they return a payload, right? So they're essentially dealing with byte slices because the payload itself contains a byte slice. And now this is all the code that you need to write whatever we just wrote in net RPCs in a single slide of 30 lines or less. Um, you have a payload codec and you have two functions. You have a marshal and you have an unmarshal, right? So you get an interface, you convert it to the payload, uh, the, the pointer to a payload. And you just say uh, p data equals to, in the unmarshal, the data is given to you. You just say p data equals to data, right? In the marshal, 
you are you start with a with a payload and you just return p dot data, which is essentially a byte slice, right? So you have done you have not encoded any protocol buffer, but you have used something similar to a protocol buffer, or actually used a protocol buffer, without actually costing anything on top of it. So if, if you notice carefully, we did not um, marshal our protocol buffer per se. We just literally had a protocol buffer in 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 memory, and we just assigned a byte slice to it, which is a zero cost operation. Sorry. Uh, the payload? Um, no. Um, this this is it really. I mean, this is the this is the whole struct. Yep. Uh, so just 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 going back to. To payload, essentially payload is is bytes data, right? So it contains. So if you if you look at the go um, the go code that is written for this, it would be essentially containing a, a method, essentially like actually containing a, a struct var called data, right? So you can assign to it, right? Um, the other way to do this would actually have been saying payload dot um, in in it from or or something of that sort, which would actually have um, caused you to like. Um, Marshall using protocol buffer code, but in this case, we didn't use any of the code. Right? And so let's look at our connection pool. Our connection pool changes a bit because if you remember in the in the past slide, we actually had a call method which would take a service method, which was a string, and then take a args and a reply. Now that we're using grpc.io, we cannot do that because grpc gives us um, equivalent of a class. So you actually have to do something like you know um, connection dot mutate or connection dot call, um, sorry, connection dot um, hello or whatever, right? You can't just pass in a string hello, you actually have to call the function, unless you do reflection, which is bad. Um, so if you look at get, the same thing, we do a select, we we try to pick from a p dot const channel, if we're able to do it, great, if we're not able to do it, we dial a new connection, um, and then for the put, we try to put it back into the channel, if we're able to put it back, great, otherwise we close that connection. And let the garbage collector remove it. And the dial new is also very simple. It's just grpc to dial with insecure. You could do more fancy stuff with TLS and stuff. But um, uh, yeah, the important thing over here is it says grpc dot with codec, which is the payload codec that we had just defined. So when it's going to receive any um, request or send out any request, it's going to call the marshal or the unmarshal method based upon the ones that we just used. And notice that all the sequencing IDs that NetRPC was using is all internally taken care of still by gRPC. We don't have to do any of that. So here's an example of how the send might look like. So you start with a context. I mean, uh, all, in fact, all of the uh, gRPC methods um, give you a context as the first argument. Um, you have a pool, and you have the byte that you want to send, um, and you you in the in the in the response you have another byte that you want to receive and an error right so you do a pool dot get which gives you a connection and if it's successful then you do a defer of pool dot put because you do want to make sure that you put it back into the pool otherwise you keep on dialing new connections every time you create a new query dot query equals to new payload which is essentially just like a min memory operation it's just like create a new struct and you set query dot data equals to data that's all and we know that when it's going to go over wire, we're literally going to take that, that data by its slice and just send it over the wire. Right? Um, you create a new client, and then you just say client.mutate. Mutate is uh, one of the methods that we had. Um, pass in the context, pass in the query, and you get back a reply, which is also a payload. Um, and you return back reply.data. Conclusion, um, gRPC not only does custom encoding, but it also leads to a lot simpler, lot smaller code footprint, because essentially you had maybe like six or seven methods. Um, you had uh, parse header, write header, then your server encoding. Uh, you had read request header, read request uh, data, then you had write, request, uh, write response, and the client, you had three more. So you had something like eight functions that you narrow it down to like two functions, Marshall and Marshall, right? You also get context for free 
which in turn allows clients to cancel pending RPC requests to do what Jeff Dean was proposing about distributed systems, along with other benefits like net tracing, which allows tracing for our RPCs and long-lived um, uh, objects, which is very useful for debugging. It also would lead you to distributed tracing. Uh, I'm not even sure, maybe Google is working upon that right now, um, but it won't be very hard to build uh, on top of your system. So some of the relevant links, uh, links uh, for this, uh, we actually had written a blog post. Um, this is the, the second link is the commit that I did, which would show you how much code was deleted as part of this, this switch, which was a lot of code was deleted. Um, Jeff Dean's presentation, Samir Ajmani's presentation on context, and then finally another presentation by Samir about the same thing. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Sorry, do we what? So GRPC is a very good system. So generally then you need to say something else. Do you both like to say one mesh or do you need to say Um yeah, uh, since the question is gRPC uses HTTP2, um, so you don't necessarily need to multiplex. I think they, they suggest that you just use one connection and just send multiple requests. Right. I think that's a good point. Um, we actually like kind of, some of it is when we moved, moved from NetRPC to gRPC, we kind of like kept our connection pool thing um, because um, I'm not sure if they allow you to to uh, parallelly send us multiple requests on the same on the same connection simultaneously. Um, so, all right, so that's something that we have to look into. I think so. This was more like we were already using the pool, and it just seemed um, um, easier for us to switch it over. Yeah. Yep. Singular pool is, serves a bit different purpose. Singular pool is more about uh, avoiding garbage collection for things. In this case, we actually have to keep um, the channel live. Um, and so, so this one is, is more about, um, yeah, I think it, we, will, we, we could potentially like kind of just iterate through the channel and just like kind of keep it, um, keep on pinging these things. And um, yeah, interesting point. Right. Right. Um, I think I think to because we need to also specify the service methods, and the service methods would require a protocol buffer. Um, unless I'm not sure, can you directly give them? Uh, uh, yeah. Now we have more actually, but um, so I think we would have to give them like bytes data directly and return bytes uh, bytes data back. Um, so payload doesn't seem too bad. I mean, if we, if we have to give them something anyways, then this is just easier. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's a, that's a good question. And uh, to be honest, like we didn't really worry about it much because we knew that what we are what we're doing is very very simple. So. There already is a performance benefit in using flat buffers or over protocol buffers. That's already clear. I think they actually have a benchmark on their webs on their website as well that you can look and compare. Um, and I'm pretty sure we actually like would have done some sort of uh, benchmarking at some point um, to see the allocations and whatnot. So th there's already benefit of using flat buffers. I think when we converted to gRPC, um, we probably went from over TCP to over HTTP2, which might have a bit of performance hit. But because it gives us like so many other benefits, um, and because we are not doing any more encoding than what we were doing before, I think it, it probably turns out to be. Uh, I would suppose it probably turns out to be the same. We haven't seen um, any adverse effect, any noticeable adverse effect. Yeah. All 
All right. Yes. Um, so we only need to, you mean when we need to re retrieve a connection from the pool, right? Um, so the question is like, is there any performance hit of using a channel in the pool? Uh, to some of the structures, yes. We actually had, we actually recently, very, very recently did that exact benchmark to figure out because we're using lexical uh, parsing as well, and we use a channel based upon Rob Pike's talk that he gave in Google Sydney maybe four years ago. And recently, in fact, last week he gave a talk and he decided he didn't use a channel. So that got us to think like, maybe we shouldn't be using a channel ourselves. So we decided to write a, a, a simple list and put a mutex lock around it. Turns out it's actually slower. Um, so channel's actually faster than that. And we did a bunch of other data structures. Um, I think we did like, um, I, I forget what we did there, but it's on the on the dgraph discuss.dgraph.io website. You will see all of that, uh, all of those benchmarks. So channel actually pretty well optimized. Uh, I think if you're gonna write a, 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 a list and then put a mutex lock around it, channel is gonna be faster than that. Yeah, based upon our experience. And the other thing is like with the select and stuff, channels just automatically work for us uh, that we don't have to write more code to make it work. So this is like, for example, the pooling code that, that we have written over here. It's probably the simplest pooling code that I've seen even compared to the ones that we had at Google because those were likely big thread pools or other kind of pools and they were doing a lot more. This is like really simple, yeah. And fast, I would say, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Nope. All right. Ah, uh, yes. That's a good question. Um, I mean, we do. So depending upon if we are not able, like, we'll block until until we re we receive a re reply back. So generally, our context, um, if you were to send a query to dgraph, we'll have a context with a timeout of one minute. So we'll try to reply back within a minute. But in case we are not able to, then the context would error out. And that's the error that we send back, which is a timeout error. But uh, you, won't re you won't receive a reply until we have executed all the steps that you have asked for. So there is definitely a guarantee that uh, we will let you know about whatever we are we were able to do, which is the best you can do. Yeah. So we don't just shoot it off like a UDP packet or something and don't worry about it. That doesn't happen. Like we actually like block on it and wait for it and then um, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thanks, guys.